Welcome, gentle reader, to this episode of Everything is Everything. Amit, I wanted to pick up the thread on a previous episode where we talked about uh, the movies that we'd like to see. Okay, and I saw a pattern that I tended to have a 13 year old's view of spectacle, of things that blow up, uh, and you tended to think in terms of the psychological thriller of going inside the minds of people placed in remarkable moments. So can I push further down that story? Tell us the ultimate movie web series that you would like to see, which is actually completely undramatic in terms of things that blow up but is happening in the minds of people and is one of the greatest stories never told. So I just want to say that you need both of these in a sense. You need the broad view and you need the narrow view. This also, by the way, uh, not the narrow view, but the zoomed in view. Mm. This also says a lot about both of us. You are the kind of person who likes to blow things up and I'm the kind of person who wants to curl up in a corner and cry. <laughs> so you have the human story and you have the explosive uh, drama and all of that. Mm. But, you know, just to tell uh, sort of the gentle reader that we thought we'll do another episode because out of all the episodes we've done so far before this, that's actually my personal favorite. You know, stories that should be films. I really enjoyed doing that because I love that kind of stuff. And I was like, let's do one more. And then we planned one more. And then what happened was that when we wrote the stories down, there is one particular story which was so grand that I said, Ki, boss, ye pura episode lag jayega. so let us do a pura episode on it, which is what we're going to do today. And the next episode will be on the other smaller, smaller stories. And we're just, have, we're just having so much fun doing this. And I hope you're enjoying watching it as well. And today's story is called The Reformers. Run with it, Amit. Yeah, so here's the opening scene of the whole series. And this is also a recurring motif through the series that it keeps coming. But I imagine it as coming here at the start of the packaging. And I imagine this scene happening randomly in middle, sometimes in quiet moments. And the audience won't know what it means till you know, maybe the whole series is ending and I see this as something that stretches across nine, ten seasons. Yeah. And I also want this to be the very last scene of the series and I'll tell you why. And this is a scene. The scene is just an overhead shot and there's a very small little glistening blue thing and a lot of land all over it. And slowly you go down, down, down and you realize it's a swimming pool. And as you come closer in the swimming pool, the blue or green of the swim, uh, swimming pool fills the screen. You realize it's a really large swimming pool and you get a sense of the scale because you realize that someone is swimming in it. What seems to be some small, small specks moving around on the screen kind of come more and more into focus as we zoom down. And we notice that they are the arms of a man and he's swimming from one end to the the other and then he pauses and he turns around and he swims to the other end and it's a recurring scene in later episodes you will have a moment where someone comes and appears to talk to him and he says something and then the person goes away and he continues swimming right and to me this is in a sense a uh, sort of uh, a motif that defines this whole theme and what we're talking about and i will explain this to you later yes. so you have this opening scene and then you have the packaging for the show and then you cut to another opening scene for that particular episode and this is something i see spanning many seasons so this is episode one of season one uh, where you see what appears to be uh, a violence of uh, uh, some action happening where colors are mixing and you pull back a little bit and you realize that someone is spreading Marmite on toast, right? Have you ever had Marmite? Yes, indeed I have. You like Marmite? I hate it. You hate it, right? Mm. So, so does the protagonist of this particular chapter and we shall talk about him. So, there is Marmite on toast uh, being spread and you pull back a little further and you see a bunch of young people who are in a room and Bare Gulam Ali Khan is playing on the stereo recorder, right? Which is, uh, right, there. did they have stereo in the 90, early 1960s? Affluent households did. Okay, so let us say that there is Bari Gulam Ali Khan playing on the recorder, uh, but the sound is kind of tinny, so you know it's not exactly a great music system. And you see a young Sardar kind of uh, sitting there, and you see a bunch of other people, and at the background there is another young Sardar. And this young Sardar sitting in the middle, as we will come to know, is a gentleman named Balbir Singh. Uh, 
Balbir Singh is an economics professor in St. Stephen's College and uh, this is his room, it's like kind of a suite, it's because there are two rooms here, in Rudra North which was one of the buildings that are there. And Balbir Singh has been to Oxford and he's come back to teach at St. Stephen's. And he enjoys this sense of sitting around with young people and talking to them about the world and whatever they know of it in the early 1960s and just chatting with it. And he wants to inculcate not the kind of education we have in India, a lot of which is rote learning and mechanical stuff, but also that spirit of debate and inquiry and so on and so forth. And the young Sadar at the back of the room is a young man named Montek Singh Aluwalia. Right. So now I will reveal what the series is called. It's called The Reformers. And I want a web series told about the reforms that have happened in India, you know, 91 onwards for 20 years being the most prominent period. And people will say, what a crazy geeky subject. And I'm like, yeah. But it's incredibly important. It got hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Uh, it had great humanitarian consequences. And what is also important is that it had a bunch of people who were fighting behind the scenes in what I think is a great freedom movement. We talk of the freedom movement of all the people who fought in India's freedom movement and did things for, uh, you know, higher principles that had no immediate reward for them. And I see the same story playing out over decades, you know, in the Indian context. So I want to tell this story through human stories, right? And my first human story is a story of Montek Singh Aluwalia. And the reason I, I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to pick five or six human stories, those are the ones I know about. I've done an episode with Montek, I've done other episodes with other protagonists and I will talk about them. Uh, so I will focus on these, but obviously there are many, 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 many more and I'll expect you to fill in some of the rest after I'm done with this narrative. So this is our introduction to Montek Singh Aluwalia, sitting on the back of the room, quiet, a little bit shy, watching the charismatic Balbir Singh, you know, talk at that particular moment, not about economics, but about music, because hey, Bare Gulam Ali Khan and he loves in the Sunny Classical. So, Montek is a young student at this uh, uh, time, St. Stephen's, Delhi. Um, you know, very normal sort of uh, family as you would imagine. Kind of relatively privileged but normal kind of family with normal values. There is a moving scene in his uh, book Backstage, which he doesn't underscore so much, but Indian men would know why it is moving, that when he wins a road scholarship, right, he wants to tell his parents about it. And those are not the days of mobile phones and all of that. So, I think he manages to connect with his mother who is in an IIC and tell her that, hey, I got this, but he tells his father in person and when he tells his father in person, all his father does is shake his hand and say congratulations. And that's it because we are just not so expressive and there is so much unspoken there that kind of reverberates. But he goes to Oxford, he works in the World Bank. Along the way, he meets uh, another uh, fine economist called... I have a detail about that scene. You have a detail about that scene? Tell me. Montek Singh Alubalia went to the UK to study by ship. There were yeah. no planes then. I Meaning it was not commonplace yeah. to use a plane. So the young man went to Bombay by train and boarded a ship. And in the form of that journey also, there is something to think about because a ship gives you time to think. Yep. A ship gives you terav. It mm. gives you time to gather your thoughts. It might also give you seasickness. I think we discussed a voyage in my episode with him, but I don't remember the details. Mm. But anyway, and... During this journey that is happening, he's going to Oxford, he's at the World Bank. He's also fallen in love with and gotten married with Ishar Jaj. And I'll come back to that because I want to talk about her in a separate chapter. Right. So let us continue down the Montek line. The first time he meets Manmohan Singh, who is a great influence in his life, is in 1970. But the uh, seminal conversation with them happens around, between them, happens at circa 1977, where just before uh, Montek has, Montek and Ishar have their first child, where Manmohan Singh come, uh, Manmohan tells him, come back. And Montek comes back. This is the late 1970s. You're working in freaking America. You, you know, you can get the best of jobs in America and Europe. This is a man who's worked in the World Bank for so many years. Comes back to India, says, okay, I'll work as an advisor in the finance ministry. There is absolutely no glory. But he comes back because he wants to serve the country in an environment where, you know, the kind of ideas that he and people like Manmohan are beginning to believe in are not given the time of day, right? And he works there silently in the background through the, you know, the, the, the couple of years of the, in the late 70s and all through the 1980s. And I want to give you an example of, uh, you know, uh, what those times were like. In 1983, 
uh, Narayan Murthy of Infosys, and Infosys, by the way, is another story that could be a web series. In 1983, Narayan Murthy of Infosys wants to import these data general computers, which are state of the art at that time, and they have three removable hard drives, which are 200 MB each. Can you imagine 200 whole MB? It is just so much. It's state of the art. It's mind blowing, right? And they can do so much with it, and they absolutely need it, but they need an import license. So for months. Uh, Narayan Murthy is making trips to the uh, ministry in Delhi and trying to get the import license for these data general, I think V8000 or whatever mm -hmm. machines. In, in our episode on three firms, my book recommendation was Soul of a New Machine. That was about a design project inside data general. Brilliant. So mm -hmm. connecting the dots. And so for months, he chases out to get this license to get this incredibly powerful computer with three drives of 200 MB each, gets the license at just about the time Data General releases the next machine where the three removable drives are 300 MB and which is 30% cheaper. So you would imagine that he'll get that, but he can't get that because the license is now for that particular model number. So he has to get the older, more expensive machine. Otherwise, there's a few more months of trying for a license of this. So anyway, so Montek is spending all of those years working in the background, you know, doing his thing, playing the long game, right? And uh, there is, and there are, uh, you know, in my series, there would also be beautiful inside looks at... I have a human detail here. Tell me your human detail. Um, the first, uh, I, I'm roughly correct, I may be slightly wrong. The first important software development center in India by a global company was done by Texas Instruments and it required a satellite dish. And basically the Indian state, you know, always wants to tell you what not to do. And Montek was one of the key people who in the mid 80s, late 80s, helped them push to get the permission to install a dish, you know, voluntary transactions by consenting adults were very complicated and that is the beginning of the great Indian software revolution. Mind-blowing, so a key role and uh, the politics of those years is described so well in various books which you know some of which I'll name later but there is Montek's backstage is sort of a good memoir of those years mm -hmm. and there is one anecdote in there which I just loved where at one point uh, he's having tea with the then cabinet secretary B.G. Deshmukh and B.G. Deshmukh lifts his cup to his lips like this and Montek also lifts his cup to his lips like this. And now there is something mimetic where they are both just standing, uh, sitting there with their cups like this. And then B.J. Deshmukh looks across the top of the cup at Montek. And he says, Ki dekho Montek, Delhi mein na, cup badalte hai, chamche nahi. <laughs> <laughs> and this is such a lovely uh, kind of uh, detail that is happening there. And then we come to the early 1990s and you have spoken so often in the past across episodes of The Seen and the Unseen and here that, you know, uh, harking back to that old Abraham Lincoln quote that if, if you give me six hours to chop a tree, I'll spend five hours sharpening the axe. Mm. So for years, all these men have sharpened the axe and in 1991 that opportunity comes when reforms can actually happen and even before this, circa 1990, there is a secret document for reforms that is prepared and circulated known today as the M document. This is like a legendary document. Our friend Shruti Rajgopalan has a great website on the 91 called the 1991 project and is reproduced there and you know we'll give all these links in the show notes as well. And this document is prepared by Montek Singh Alwalia. It is a roadmap for reform before the crisis hits. So when the crisis hits, which is a balance of payments crisis and the IMF wants India to kind of reform and all of these reformers are there in the background, you know, great names and you will tell us more about them. Amarnath Varma, Rakesh Mohan, IG Patel, there's just so many of these uh, public service oriented people in the background acting against their incentives and for higher principles who are kind of making this happen. And Montek is one of the players in this game. And he describes, in fact, how at one point in the Ministry of Finance, there is this urgency that we need to get the work done. So 80 people are taken down to a, um, a facility in the basement of the Ministry of Finance and I'm sure you've been there and after this you can tell me about that. 80 people are taken to the basement of the Ministry of Finance and they are locked there for eight days because it has to be done in secrecy you know, before the budget comes out. They're not allowed to leave. Dormitory style beds are prepared for them, senior officers and so on. Food food is brought in. Only really senior people like perhaps a finance minister, finance secretary are allowed to come in and out. But once you're in, you know, you can check out, but you can never leave for those eight days. And in that kind of secrecy, the first sort of budget document is uh, prepared. Later, there is a moment and this brings out of them things that 
others did not know that they had. Like there is a scene where Montek Singh Aliwala is talking to the JPC, the Joint Parliamentary Committee, and they're asking questions on the reforms and this question and that question and this question and that question. And at the end of it, one of the MPs when he's going out is asked by this TV uh, reporter that uh, kaisa tha? And he said, Sardar ji bohut bolte hai. <laughs> And again, uh, you know, and, and uh, Montek from the little that I know of him and he recorded an episode with me, just a genteel, cultured, charming, soft-spoken man, not something uh, one would expect to be said about him, but an absolutely remarkable man. And uh, so this is one of my many human stories. Uh, and uh, here we come to the end of our chapter. I have a trade liberalization story in this. Tell me. Okay, which I think uh, N.K. Singh told me at some point. Uh, he said that he was in an elevator uh, or N.K. Singh was revenue secretary and somebody told him this story. You're in an elevator at the IMF and there were two people or multiple people in the elevator and suddenly one person turned back, sight unseen, turned back to a person behind and said, you're from India, aren't you? And the other person said, yeah. yeah. How do you know? It's like without looking at me, it's like you had eyes behind uh, your head and not you are Indian, you are from India. So what was the backstory? The backstory was that if you are a male who is an unfortunate owner of a thing called a suit, then you have to get these things dry cleaned. Okay, So that's how you try to establish class differences because, you know, poor people can't afford to get their clothes dry cleaned. And uh, at the time, the import of the correct fluids to be used for dry cleaning was banned into India. Wow. Because these are luxuries. So dry cleaning in India was done with some bad petrochemicals, which left a distinctive stink on a suit. So if a suit had a certain smell, then it meant that that person was from India. Amazing. <laughs> then you suit, suit karda. Yes, Amit, next chapter. Next chapter. Narsimha. Next season? Uh, not really, because these are intermingling uh, stories. Okay. So in my mind, there is one particular uh, period, seminal period, that is a season on its own, and we will come to that. But this, uh, but these are characters and there's interplays happening. You're cutting back and forth between different times and etc, etc. But this chapter is about uh, P.V. Narsimha Rao, you know. And it's... There are so many layers to this story, right? Uh, at one level, uh, today you might summarize this whole thing as, oh, 1991 reforms. But the story of P.V. Narsimha Rao is incredibly fascinating and he was a great man in his own way. He wasn't just a politician who happened to be there and, oh, acha cheez kia, Manmohan ke reforms ko support kia. It wasn't just that. He was a great man in many other ways. I recommend this fabulous book by Vinay Sitapati called Half Lion. Uh, Vinay has been a guest on my show. We've had an episode on this, one of my popular episodes. So check that out, out as well. Now, P.V. Narsimha Rao was a very learned man, right? He was born, I think, around 1920, 1921 is, I think, when he was born. He knew 10 languages naturally. Growing up where he did in Andhra Pradesh, and of course, he knew Telugu, but he also knew uh, Hindi, he also knew Marathi, he also knew Kannada, he also knew Urdu, he also knew Persian. So he had at least 10 languages which he knew well. And later in his life, in the 1980s, when computers came to India and he was a minister and he was part of what is called the Delhi Darbar, he also uh, taught himself computer languages. So he could code fluently in COBOL and BASIC. And he actually, uh, you know, wrote for Unix. You know, so he was just someone full of incredible curiosity, a man of deep culture and learning, always reading. And yet, uh, you know, you realize that in Delhi, he wasn't taken seriously because one, they just don't take the South seriously. And for them, you know, learning and refinement for Delhi means the very superficial things of how you speak English and how you hold your cup and have you read some particular uh, uh, book that might be in vogue. And this was a man who knew so many languages, who had read literature in many of these languages. And more than that, more than all of this, like more than learning, what I am often impressed by is the capacity to constantly learn, the curiosity uh, to constantly uh, reinvent yourself. Like if you look at the table of contents in Vinay's book, you know, you will find chapters which are titled Andhra's Socialist, 
another chapter is titled puppet chief minister another chapter is titled delhi darbar these are phases of his life is there a gorbachev character here that there was actually immense depth of knowledge and at the same time he was a master of the intrigue that is required to achieve and maintain power so he was a master player of the power game he understood the intrigue and the double dealing and the entrepreneurship that is required to achieve and maintain power but there was a wing in his mind which was also a deep thinker and he was a gorbachev in terms of being able to do all this i don't know enough about gorbachev to make that uh, uh, analogy so i leave that to you but what you describe is exactly him mm -hmm. but it wasn't just that he was also uh, a very street smart solid politician a sort of machiavelli good at scheming and all of that that is part of the thing he did know how to play that game but what is also true is that some of it was happenstance like uh, vinay has this um, telling line in his book which i remember that what made him survive all the politics of the coterie the backstabbing and this and that is his loneliness his greatest quality was his loneliness he was uh, i mean he is no more here but if you were to ask him what is the best way for you to spend an evening it would probably be not out politicking and doing all of this but just you know reading a nice book learning something new that's the kind of man he was and you know there are detailed graphic instances of after uh, you know rajiv gandhi dies the jostling for power within the congress party and what gets him the role is that he's not trying for it he's seen to not be trying for it and therefore that makes him acceptable to so to some extent it is happens trance and a lot of this is the accidents of history like the post was first offered to shankar deval sharma who was like no he was vice president then and he said no i'd rather uh, kind of uh, become president later as he indeed did and he didn't really want the uh, you know the rough and tumble of active politics he was like i can chill and be in the rashtrapati bhavan not in so many words obviously because i don't think mr sharma would have said i can chill but uh, you know so it's kind of accidents of history which take us to the point where narsimha rao is in charge where manmohan happens to be his finance minister and a lot of sort of um, circumstances lead you here and it's not only that he is handling the politics he is doing more than that you know often there is a portrayal that he handled the politics really well but the real people who fought uh, who got the job done are the manmohans and the montaks and all and of course the manmohans and the montaks and all are great heroes of mine but narsimha rao also has to be given much credit and it wasn't just for the uh, politics that he made those things happen it was he was a true believer you know there is um, uh, like one of the nice little scenes in our web series can be he is meeting with akyo morita akyo morita is and the chairman of sony right and um, and he leans over at one point to mr morita and almost whispers that do you know there are millions of indians who dream of nothing greater than having a sony television <laughs> why don't you set up a factory here <laughs> and mr morita turns to him and says in his gentle understated way and perhaps all japanese people are gentle and understated as what it seems to be sorry for the stereotype but it's not a bad one yeah. and mr morita says to him in a gentle and understated way but for that i need so many licenses and i'll never get them and narsimha rao leans in further and in a softer voice says you just apply leave the rest to me right and then everything that kind of happens happens but there is a tragic tinge to this story uh, that you know uh, the the modern congress of today will often uh, you know they should hail narsimha rao as one of the heroes they should own 90 the 91 liberalization and take full credit for it but often they don't and they turn away and narsimha rao was soon an outcast within the congress party itself and there is a time of when he died in 2004 you know that night in when he describes as graphically in his book television channels showed scenes of his half lit funeral pyre in uh, i think hyderabad itself because uh, the congress did not allow his body to be brought to delhi for a state funeral and there was a uh, sort of his half exposed skull on the funeral pyre and stray dogs uh, you know coming at the pyre to get, take the remains of the body this was a prime minister this was one of the greatest uh, men one of the greatest indians of the 20th century who you know whose actions helped lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and petty politics ensured that you know that in the end uh, uh, you know uh, this is kind of how it goes and it makes me so angry and i remember atul bihari vajpayee um, uh, gave him a tribute then and uh, you know spoke really eloquently about him and mr vajpayee himself of course is a character in our story and at one point mr vajpayee revealed something that was not known to them and this was a meeting that happened in may 1996 
when manmohan singh uh, when sorry when pv narsimha rao is handing over power to uh, vajpai who had just taken over for a short while and he tells vajpai samagri taiyar hai baki aap karo and he was referring to uh, the nuclear test you know that they had prepared it they wanted it to happen but there were elections and they had the grace to leave it for the next government so this is narsimha rao telling vajpai ji samagri taiyar hai memorable words i have a similar story on uh the graceful transition and the handover uh one of the greatest milestones in indian economic history was the uh, establishment of the inflation targeting regime uh, in 1934 when the rbi was created it was a temporary measure in the preamble of the rbi act according to the british that they had no idea what they were doing so as a temporary measure we create the reserve bank of india and the concept of the reserve bank of india really only began in 2015 when uh, there was the monetary policy uh, framework agreement that was signed between rajiv maharishi and raghuram rajan that work was hatched in 2013 and it was mature at a file level it was agreed by monte kaluwalia and manmohan singh and chidambaram but elections were coming so chidambaram wrote on file that we think this is a good idea but this is one of the big momentous things in indian economic history it should not be rushed through in the late months of a lame duck administration so i leave this to my successor and arun jetli came in as a successor understood this whole thing and then the implementation happened so that's the decency and grace by which we can build complex projects across elections i have a further detail to add to that mm-hmm. so i've done this dear uh, reader i have done this great epi- episode of the seen and the unseen more than 8 hours with kp krishnan uh you know a great man and i have a chapter on him and i'll talk about that and uh, a great piece of oral history and he elaborates upon that there and 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 what happens is like first of all he talks about how in in the 2000s you know kp krishnan and a certain young man called ajay shah were you know considered heretics because they were talking about inflation targeting all the time but eventually uh, mr krishnan and his team kind of made it happen and it got through to the stage where uh, manmohan singh said this this is great we must do it chidambaram said this is great we must do it but as you just said the elections are coming so they leave it for the next government so then when the jetli ministry comes kp krishnan takes a document to arun jetli and says here you know have a look at this and the next morning arun jetli says let's go with it and kp krishnan is like no wo 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 wait a, wait a second this is radical right i support it this is wonderful but it's radical so give a little thought to it think about the ramifications and all that and uh, mr jetli feels insulted as if you know he hasn't given enough easy being accused of not being a thinker and he says no 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 we are we are going with this and then when krishnan insists then jetli tells him that listen two of india's finest legal and economic minds have said yes to this who am i to disagree <laughs> and those minds are manmohan singh and pp chidambaram and this is arun jetli talking right okay. and it's a, a sort of such a, a kind of a beautiful moment and i think around 2015 is i think when this all okay. breaks and falls apart and we were many episodes of the scene and the unseen on that i'll uh, link them from the show notes so uh, a remarkable story but my chapter on mr krishnan comes a little later i have a, another chapter before that Okay Amit next story So the next story is about two remarkable women uh and just because these are relatively short stories i don't mean to say that they are not important it's just that i know only this much about them and i should know much more and there are ways to know much more i'll recommend books by each of them which will help you get a better sense but this was not just uh, uh this was not just a manual world uh, you know women played a key role in this and uh, they need to be mentioned and one of them of course was ishar judge who married monte kaluwalia and uh, became ishar judge aluwalia now she was from a conservative Sikh family. Uh, she went to an all-girls Marwari school in Calcutta, right? And there, there was there was no sense of higher education, go abroad, do all of this. That was simply not there in her background. But she was kind of um, uh, ambitious, intellectually ambitious by disposition. So she went to Presidency College, and then later on she shifted uh, to Delhi, and she kind of uh, did all of her own things there. And when she was in Delhi, uh, she had trouble for a few years, which she revealed.
revealed much later and she has a great autobiography called breaking through so i recommend everyone read that it's it's a beautiful book and she had trouble for a few months uh, figuring out english well enough because this all girls marwari school she went to was hindi medium so a she had trouble learning english it was kind of halting uh, which also becomes a barrier to soaking up all the economics knowledge of the world because it's in english so imagine how much harder uh, she had to work and she also had a suspicion of these slick delhi boys with their accents and you know always saying fancy things in english uh, but luckily for montek as he points out what did help him was a sense of humor which he kind of liked and uh, he's such a wonderful self effacing man though i don't know if he was like that then because we are different when we are young but uh, they kind of uh, got together uh, became a couple but when you read uh, what montek writes about it and how he talks about her and when you read her own book breaking through you realize that this is not just a strong personality but this is also a very fine thinker a very fine economist uh, works with him through all of these years an important person and uh, you know and it's really charming the days of their early courtship where they would go and watch european films they would watch goda and trufo and uh, bresson and uh, um, um, all of these films and uh, you know part of their courtship of discovering each other is also discovering the world and and i think in some ways this is a natural quality that all of these reformers all these protagonists have this natural curiosity we are not happy with the way things are we want to know the world we want to figure it out so you know an important uh, kind of figure and another absolutely seminal figure who might you know deserve a film in her own right is a great padma desai right padma desai was a brilliant economist often known in some ways of uh, uh, often known unfortunately for being uh, you know jagdish bhagwati's wife and that's not all she was she was a great economist in her own right like recently i was uh, try, you know uh, trying to read what has been said about the seminal book that they brought out in 1968 you know arguing against the indian state system arguing for reforms and this is 1968 it's a co-written book by jagdish bhagwati and padma desai and obviously his name only comes first because of the accident of you know alphabetical order of surname and when i googled it everywhere it is uh, saying that the book is by jagdish bhagwati and then when you going deeper you see her name and it's a tragedy because she was an expert in the subject she studied in particular uh, the soviet union for years and years wrote a seminal book in 1989 about perestroika and enormously respected scholar in all of these years and an enormously strong woman like she was in an abusive bad marriage before she met jagdish bhagwati she was in love with him she wanted to marry him she wasn't being granted a divorce how do you do it she says fuck it i'll do whatever it takes and one way that one uh, one of the grounds for a divorce was change of religion so she converted to Christ- christianity <laughs> just to be able to marry uh, the love of her life and i mean there is a lot else i can say about her but everyone should read her autobiography called breaking out so the earlier book breaking through this is breaking out by padma desai again just a remarkable woman and i i, I just feel that the women in the story are doubly remarkable like the men are remarkable because they're going against the tide they're on a l- lonely journey driven by principle driven by passion uh, with very little chance of success playing that long game the women are doubly remarkable because women are not in this game at all to be able to come up and to assert yourself and to become uh, you know uh, part of the discourse j- alone just takes so much courage and even now you know when i invite women on the scene and the unseen almost every single woman has so much imposter syndrome they're they're saying why me what have i done to you know and the men never have that the men are ha ha atao batao date batao time batao and the women are like are you sure you want me and i'm like you know and the most accomplished uh, and uh, women you can imagine have kind of said this to me so back in that day in that kind of patriarchal world where much more patriarchal than today uh, where you know the ministries and the academics departments are full of men to have this kind of courage to assert yourself and to be a voice i think kind of take something and it is only my limited knowledge that i am speaking of these two women and that too in such uh, uh, in such a cursory way but there are stories there to be told uh, i have two tidbits uh, here once i was at a dinner table with jagdish bhagwati and somehow he was storytelling uh, he said that his brother the famous uh, pn bhagwati uh, stumbled on the fact that uh, jagdish bhagwati and padma desai were living in sin and he apparently grumbled that you should know that it's a crime under the ipc so just be careful 
a crime under the IPC. And you know, this reminds me of a law that is thankfully gone, but I used to rant about it endlessly. I think it went three or four years back as part of the IPC, the adultery law, yeah. right? And the adultery law essentially uh, uh, talks of adultery as a crime on the husband. Like if a woman sleeps yeah. with another man outside the marriage, it is as if his property has been stolen. That's a wording. I wrote a column on it. I'll link it from the show notes. Yeah. But it is as if the aggrieved party is a man whose wife slept with someone else yeah. and the, uh, the, the culprit is the other guy as if the woman is just being property, property. and is theft. Yeah. So, and other laws like this still exist in the IPC where the law effectively treats women as a property of men, yeah. you know, which is absolutely uh, yeah. sort of so hard. And, and I have one uh, tidbit around Isher, the sweetest thing that anybody ever said to me in my whole life is uh, when I first moved to Delhi, I had, uh, when I joined the Ministry of Finance and I had lunch with uh, Isher and she said to me that, uh, uh, she felt that my articulation was a bit at the level of young Montek. Wow. I think that's a compliment for young Montek, <laughs> but we can see. But I'm sure young Montek's humor was better than yours, Ajaysha. <laughs> no doubt. No, and and one of the sort of the, the things that I regret is I bought Isher's book when it was out and I kept it thinking I'm going to read it at some point. I must invite her. But then she passed away. And then I read it after that while researching for my episode with Montek. And I just hit myself on the head. And I'm sure Montek won't mind my saying this, that I said that, man, I should, I, I, should, I would have recorded with her first because it's such a lovely book such a great mind. Go on Amit, chapter 3. So my, it's not actually chapter 3, you're losing count. What kind of card carrying economist are you when you can't even count? Sergi, yes, you know. So anyway, so uh, this chapter is uh, my final chapter till I lead over to you. There are so many individuals who deserve to be spoken about. So this is, it's a sign of my limitation that these are the people I have recorded episodes with and know in a certain way. This is, of course, KP Krishnan, eight-hour masterpiece with him, enabled by you, uh, thankfully. And uh, I just urge everyone to go and kind of listen mm -hmm. to that episode. And um, I want to start now by revealing what that one season should be about. Like I told you, the whole thing should be 10 seasons. And of that, one season is about one particular thing. And that season is about the 2008 financial crisis. That India has now been, uh, you know, entangled in the global economy, a part of the global economy for a few years, which it wasn't before. And this is the first crisis since it, it has been sort of enmeshed in the global economy. And how will India deal with it, right? And uh, this season i wanted to begin with that swimming scene again which keeps popping up in between elsewhere but after the packaging happens this is the first scene right there is a dimly lit basement there is a panel discussion going on in delhi right there are four people out there on the stage you ajay shah have suddenly become a character because you are there you're moderating that panel discussion and over there there is kp krishnan from the finance ministry uh bhave and Subara, Subara, of course, governor of uh, RBI and uh, Bhave of SEBI, right? Mm -hmm. So these three are there on stage with you and you're talking and uh, there's no phone signal here in this basement. And at one point, uh, a gentleman uh, comes and he goes to Mr. Krishnan and whispers something in his ear and Mr. Krishnan just gets up and goes out. And then another person goes and says something to Subara and he gets up and leaves. And then another person comes in and says something to uh, Bhave and he gets up and leaves. And you're suddenly moderating a conversation <laughs> with no participants. You're all alone there wondering what the hell happened. But the audience no, long, uh, no doubt doesn't give a damn because you're on stage and you're so beautiful and they're just looking at you lost in rapture, yeah. right? But uh, what actually happened is that the 2000, I think that was when Lehman Brothers had collapsed and this is a finance minister, Mr. Chidambaram, looking for the three people he has to talk to right now and finding that all of their phones are uh, not reachable. What is going on? So he gets calls through to their drivers and says, Bulao unko, bhejo unko, right? And the story of how 
uh, all of you guys because you you know you also described about how you work day and night behind the scenes helping the, uh, these people but these were of course the main protagonists how they handled the 2008 crisis mm -hmm. is just incredibly inspiring to me and i think like deserves a season on its own uh, to, to the sense that i hardly have anything i i don't want to say anything about it but it's a season on its own listen to my episode with him and uh, if i'm ever show running a show like this the details will blow your mind it might even be two seasons yeah. and uh, and krishnan had some great stories not just about the whole reforms process and of getting it through um, and the battle study phase, but also about the politics of the time, to go back to our earlier theme. Like one of his stories that struck with me, and you and I, along with our friend Renuka Sane, did a great episode on pensions, right? You guys got the new pension scheme through. And uh, uh, and that again was something that was passed on from one government which loved it to another government which adopted it. And there is a story of how, uh, you know, when... Um, uh, the Congress government, when they take over, this is prepared by the Vajpayee government, given to the Congress government. Uh, Manmohan Singh totally gets it and wants to do it. And at one point, they're sitting across a table with Sushma Swaraji convincing her. And Sushma Swaraj is now in the opposition. And I think Mr. Krishna told me this uh, story. And uh, uh, she listens to the whole idea, which at some level she must already know because it originated in the previous government. And then she says that, listen, this is wonderful. This is good for the country. You must do it. But let me tell you something. In public, because I'm in the opposition, if you bring it to parliament, I will have to oppose it. But I want it to happen. So this is a strategy through which you make it happen. First you do like this, then you do like that. Right? And this is just such a beautiful story and it fills my heart with joy. Now, there is a side narrative which we have described in across many episodes. Pooja Mehra wrote a book, The Lost Decade, about it, uh, where a certain downfall started, which is basically when the terrorist attacks of Bombay happened, uh, the, the, you know, Shivraj Patil, who was then the Home Minister, was didn't prove to be particularly competent. So Manmohan Singh had to shift his best man to the Home Ministry, which was Mr. Chidambaram. And that meant in the Finance Ministry, uh, you know, uh, Sonia Gandhi got Pranab Mukherjee put there and then Manmohan had to go in for an operation and Pranab just stayed Finance Minister. And he was a, a complete disaster as a Finance Minister, did things like retrospective taxation and various other things detailed in those episodes in Pooja's book. And eventually uh, that perhaps enabled the change of government that happened. He was, of course, kicked upstairs to the presidency. Chidambaram tried to do good things for a few months. Jaitley continued for a few months. But 2015, we went to hell again. That's a long political story I don't want to get into. But what I was struck by when talking with um, Krishnan was an anecdote he related about Pranab itself, that there was some important financial sector reform that Krishnan really wanted. And uh, Pranab's instinctive socialist 1970s Indra self would have revolted at it. So he, Krishnan had to figure out how do I figure this to him. So he took to him a presentation with two slides, right? And the first slide was a picture of a postcard that was sent to uh, Pranab Mukherjee from one of his constituents in Bengal. And uh, when the thing comes on screen, Pranab says, wait, wait, what is that? Read it out. Someone read it out. And this is a letter from a lady called Sharmishta Bandupadhyay talking about, I forget the details, but essentially her life has been destroyed. Her life savings are uh, gone. Uh, she, you know, financially, she's been ruined, etc., etc. And all of that. It's a really sad story. And then saying that it's up to you to do something about it. And uh, Pranab is furious when the end of this letter comes. And he says, why are you reading this out for me? What do you want? And then Krishnan explains exactly what he wants. And what he wants is what he's, the message he's trying to give is that the current system, the way it is, harms the common people. It, uh, you know, can turn poor people into completely destitute. It harms um, housewives like Sharmishtra Bandupadhyay who can't make good decisions themselves. And then he proposes a reform that will change everything. And from this angle, from this lens, Pranam Mukherjee says, Theek hai karo. So some of the dramatic financial reforms. Now you can't talk about financial reforms to a large audience because it is so incredibly boring, right? But they affect our lives deeply, desperately. We need to figure out ways to sort of tell that story. And I love the way that Mr. Krishnan, with all these decades of experience, you know, he was a side player in a sense in one of the ministries during the 91 reforms. And, you know, after that, not a main character, but someone sort of uh, looking on. And I love the way in which uh, he figures out a strategy to present this to the politicians. So it happens that way. A man of deep integrity and a man who sadly, in a sense, in the last years of his career didn't occupy the important influential positions he should have uh, post 2015 something that he will be modest about in um, 
you know he 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 will not harp on too much but it is something that looking on from a distance i feel that a lot of these reformers were sort of out in the cold and left out and at this point i want to go back to swimming what is that swimming scene and uh, krishnan loves to swim it is so much a part of his regimen that uh, he's actually during a cabinet meeting that was going on and on he said can i go out for an hour and the person with him he relates this in the episode i forget who either a minister or a fellow senior person says why do you want to go where do you want to go what's so urgent he says i want to swim i want to swim and i want to come back and this is never interrupted my 8 hour episode with him was recorded over four sessions it could have been three sessions but it was four because in the third session he we hit the swimming time which was 6 o'clock <laughs> and uh, you know we were together at a conference in uh, kochi and uh, he said that no i checked out the pool earlier i am going to go swimming and i said sir please go uh, because i respect that so much that someone having that conviction and the force of will not just about the larger things but about the smaller things that have to do with one's own routines and one's own character and all of that and to me this is a great metaphor that you're swimming alone you know someone interrupts you at one point and you send him away you continue to swim and right at the end the last scene you're still swimming alone yeah just to build on uh, these things um what had happened was that we had planned a conference months ahead of time and we had no idea that the date was 14th and 15th September uh, 2008 and on the 13th Lehman blew up so suddenly that conference was just in a very unfortunate timing uh, i remember i i i am a student i i'm just a researcher looking at this world i never played any role as a policy maker on 13th when uh, lehman was filing for bankruptcy in america through that day in india there was a great deal of turbulence okay so i think enough people knew that something terrible is around the corner and there was a little bit of a run emerging on icici bank okay now maybe some of it was rumors at some locations some queues did build up runs on banks are terrifying things and run a run on an important bank icici bank would be a really big problem to think about so i was trying to amass every fact that i could and the most important fact is the stock price so as of 3:30 pm when the nse would close the icici bank stock was a little bit down but not yet a catastrophe then comes the evening where there may have been developments on the run and you know we in india had rumors we had some facts there is a fog of war at the time you actually don't know a whole lot of what's going on and many of the people speaking the most uh, loudly about the subject have an axe to grind so achieving situational awareness is genuinely hard so i vividly remember that i was just waiting and waiting and waiting for the american market to open because i wanted to see the stock price of the icici adr in america and i just like watched and watched that price for some hours because all the news and information that had unfolded after the nse close at 3:30 would funnel its way into trouble in the adr price and i remember nothing much happened in the adr price so late in the night i slept and i thought we're okay there's nothing much there's no trouble at icici bank and in indeed that was the case and the next morning i woke up and i went to the conference but by the time our conference began the american day had unfolded and in that american day lehman had collapsed and all hell was broke, breaking loose including a money market choke in bombay so our conference had begun in the day and it was in a basement at the ihc so that little drama happened there lovely story so ajay that's kind of my narrative it's a uh, i i didn't want to go too much into that i've spoken like i for me it's a human story every good story is a human story as we said at the start of the episode mm-hmm. and i am just in awe of um uh, the, the the five people are named during this episode montek okay. narsimha padma desai ishwar judge um you know kp krishnan but i am also in awe of many of the other reformers of era's past manmohan singh himself mm-hmm. uh, you know what a remarkable man what a remarkable man you know uh, i've had various episodes where people have spoken about his fortitude during the nuclear deal where he he was willing to sacrifice everything because he was like no this is so good for india yeah. we have to do this i will give up everything i will put my neck on the line but we have to do this right? 
right? And, uh, uh, you know, and all the unnamed bureaucrats in the background, Amarnath, Varma, Rakesh, Mohan, Najib, uh, Patel, etc., etc. Uh, you know, so tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, you have been a player in this business. You are also a character. We should think about which actor plays you. A three millimeter sized player. We should think uh, about which actor plays you. <laughs> you know, who, who would you like to play you? Um, I haven't thought about it. I, once I was teaching at ISB and uh, there was a young woman who said, I look like somebody from Hollywood and I've forgotten the name. Oh my God. Huh? This is your story. Okay. But <laughs> I, I, I will, I will, you know, if, if uh, Netflix people or, uh, you know, people who produce this ever watching this, Suvinder Vicky for Montek Singh Aluwalia. Okay. That is my perfect uh, casting right there. And I, if I think about it, I'm sure I'll fill up all the others. But Suvinder Vicky played the main role in this marvelous series called Kora. And so impressed by his acting. And I recorded an episode recently with Danish Hussain, who was equally impressed. And he said he first noticed Suvinder Vicky in this film called Milestone by Ivan Ayer. Uh, so, you know, um, that's a casting there. But we'll figure out who plays you later. But yeah, tell me more stories. So, uh, my taste in movies tends to be things that blow up. But uh, I also respect, uh, for me, an eye-opener was uh, Steven Spielberg's movie, Lincoln, which is about the 13th Amendment. It's not about the things that blow up. It's not about the Civil War. There is no grand narrative around the Battle of Gettysburg. Okay, it's about the 13th Amendment and it's a deep legal battle about getting one amendment through to the Constitution. And my God, it is great storytelling. So, you know, I'm entirely with you. Uh, and I also share the sense that this is many seasons because actually it is rich with stories and there is just so much that happened by many, many actors. Um, I remember uh, one interesting element is that moment of recruitment. Okay, so uh, I, I remember Kelkar telling me that he was working in Geneva. He had come to Kathmandu for a conference and in the corridor, he met Manmohan Singh and Manmohan Singh did that Jedi hand wave and said, so you will come to work with us, won't you? And Kelkar just felt obliged to say yes. 1973? 74 or something. 74. This yeah. is, uh, for those who don't know, you must not assume that everybody knows. You'll give a surname, everybody knows who this person is. Mm. This is a great Vijay Kelkar, okay. another important character in this drama. In some ways, your mentor, in also in other ways, your co-author on the brilliant yeah. book In Service of the Republic. Have we mentioned it before? <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, fine. A, a couple of hundred times. <laughs> yeah. um, so, K Kelkar said it was not a question. It was not like he was given much of a choice. You'll come work for us, won't you? And Kelkar just felt obliged to say yes. And like next thing you know, there was an offer letter and he packed his bags and he moved uh, to India. Uh, si similarly, I have been doing some oral history with Kirit Parikh and long story short, but basically uh, th there was a key person who uh, recruited him and it took two years for Kirit Parikh to relocate uh, to India. First, he was in the Atomic Energy Commission, then Vikram Sarabhai died. And then uh, Kirit Parikh was ready to do Planning Commission stroke uh, ISI. And so he reached out to the guy and said, okay, you know, you told me this a while ago. Do you think we could do it now? He said, yeah, just whenever you want it, just come. You're on. <laughs> we want you. Um, uh, I know one tiny story of that nature. Um, I remember I introduced Viral Shah to Nandan Nilekani at a conference at NCAER and they met up later that evening and uh, Nandan had offered uh, Viral a job to come work at the UID AI and Viral said yes. So I think that this is very interesting uh, recruitment story around many of these people. I remember one uh, Thursday evening Rakesh Mohan called me and said uh, uh, we want to consider bringing you into the Ministry of Finance. Can you fly to Delhi tomorrow morning? So I said, okay. And I went to Delhi and I came back and I had said yes. So th there's a very interesting little recruitment story inside uh, each of these people coming into the lives that they did. And another nugget here is, and you should tell this, I shouldn't, but you told it to me and it just came to mind, mm -hmm. is that one day in 2005, K.P. Krishnan walks into your office at the Ministry of Finance and says, I'm joining the Ministry of Finance. And you look up at him sadly, uh, you know, and, and with a wistful smile on your face and say, oh shit, I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he's a big guy. He blasted into the door and said, hello, Ajay, here I am. I've just joined. 
by the way, as JS administrative in the Ministry of Finance. And I said, Krishnan, this is my last day here. <laughs> so we'd met previously at a, at a conference on water. Mm -hmm. Krishnan was a legend in the world a of legend, water supply. And uh, so I knew him from before and I said, today is my last day here. And it was also the day my mother died. I was packing my boxes and uh, leaving the Ministry of Finance. Um, the other piece that I have felt about this period, there's a story that really means a lot to me, which is uh, Vijay Kelkar's journey in the uh, Ministry of Petroleum. Okay, So Kelkar was an economist and he was an advisor at the Ministry of Petroleum. He worked closely with uh, Lavraj Kumar, uh, whose friends call him Lavi. And uh, Lavraj Kumar was the secretary of the Ministry of Petroleum. And uh, you cannot imagine the starting point of that period. The starting point of that period is was one where the Indian state had a complete monopoly on anything petroleum. So whether you said exploration or extraction or refining, or, or distribution or downstream petrochemical applications. Everything was government of India. And Lavraj Kumar and Kelkar understood that this is a bad idea, that you need the private sector deeply in everything. And there is no case for state monopolies in these things. And in fact, you need to ultimately get to privatizing the government's activities in these areas. First, Kelkar was mentored by Lavraj Kumar. So he was the economist. He had that more strategic understanding of the fundamental economics of that sector. Lavraj Kumar was the secretary. He knew how to work the bureaucratic political machine. Then Lavraj Kumar finished up in his time there. And the universe was so organized that a non-IAS Vijay Kelkar was hired as the secretary petroleum and across governments got six years there. So Kelkar spent some years as advisor and then six years as secretary and through that entire period was able to strategize that complete opening up of all the pieces of this so that exploration became private, extraction became private, refining became private, distribution kind of fumbled and didn't work out, petrochemicals became private. But that long journey of doing many, many things takes many years and it requires this kind of teamwork and intellectual firepower of Lavraj Kumar and Vijay Kelkar and the larger policy ecosystem where there is that level of elite capability. So I think this is really a big piece of what has changed about India today and that isn't working like it used to. And this is something that we need to think about. So I find it very interesting to go inside the minds of these people and their human relationships and their ability to protect and foster these ideas across political changes of governments, leadership, ministers come, ministers go. But you need this stability of the professional elite of public policy in India that is able to think and sustain each other and protect each other and become that institutional memory that carries knowledge across. I want to ask you a question. And here's a question. And I'll restate an anecdote before that. And this is something uh, Noshad Forbes, while recording his Seen Unseen episode with me, told me. I don't remember if it was in the book or the episode or he said it offline. But essentially what he said was that he was at this meeting where Manmohan Singh was explaining his ideas to leaders of industry, you know, Swaka 91, 92 perhaps. And he was one of those leaders of industry there, Naushad. I think on one side of him, there was uh, Ambani on another side, JRD Tata or something like that. You know, Tata and Ambani on each side of him and it became a famous photograph. And everybody was asking, who's that guy in the middle? But <laughs> so Naushad Forbes a very fine, uh, 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 you know, business leader on his own right. And at the end of it, when everybody was shaking hands and he was shaking hands with uh, Manmohan, Manmohan, Manmohan just, you know, held his hand, pulled him forward a little bit and whispered in his ear that uh, because Noshad had been speaking during the meeting in support and all that. So Manmohan held, uh, holds his hand, pulls him a little forward and whispers in his ear that tell the world everything you said today inside here. Right. And the reason for that is that there was so little support. There was so little public support. Nobody got it. Everybody was doing conventional thinking. And the question I would therefore want to ask you is that Tell me a little bit about how all these individuals 
find that sense of purpose when what they are fighting for is so counterintuitive and hard to explain and they are so easy to attack. It is very easy to, if somebody says the state should not do this, it is very easy to misinterpret that and say, oh, the state should not help the poor. He is anti-poor. He is anti, uh, he is pro-business. Though obviously pro-business and pro-markets are opposites as we know. And so the whole, it's very easy to attack you. It's very hard to for you to explain your counterintuitive ideas of positive sum games and spontaneous order. And yet, not for years, but for decades, these people don't do what people like me do, write columns and be armchair columnists. But for years and decades, these people devote their lives to playing this long game. How is that happening? So I have two parts to my understanding of this. One part is that... Uh, it is very important to psychoanalyze the Indian elite starting from 1947. In 1947, if there was a post-colonial experience that was supposed to work out right, it was India. Okay? This is the land of Rabindranath Tagore and Ramanujan and Nehru and Gandhiji. Robi Thakur. Okay. So there was no better post-colonial country. That There was a capability here that was up there as good as England. Okay, that you had people like uh, we, we've done an episode on C.R. Rao and you had people like Ramanujan and so on. So if there was a single country that was supposed to work out correctly, it was supposed to be India. It was very, very bruising for the Indian elite that actually things didn't quite work out well. So after independence, there was a brief spurt of performance. And then we've talked in an episode of everything is everything which for which you have the enigmatic title, Why Freedom Matters, but it's actually an economic history piece. We talk about that terrible period that India went through, where uh, there was a China war in 62, dot, 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 the emergency of 76. And that was precisely the period where it became apparent that East Asia has taken off. Okay, so Japan was an old successful country, but then a whole bunch of other countries were proving that you could build high GDP growth through much greater openness to the world, most notably Korea and Taiwan, but also a bunch of the uh, East a Southeast Asian countries had achieved an economic growth. And I have heard this from many of the protagonists that this felt like a personal affront. And how could this happen? You know, we're India, we're supposed to do better. And watching those East Asian countries do things in a more capitalistic way, in a more globalization way, was just cold water on the face of the Indian elite. And that angst, that self-respect out of the independence movement, that self-respect of being the country of Gandhiji and Nehru and Tagore and Ramanujan was thrown into extreme cognitive dissonance with the relative failure of India from 62 to 76 versus the success of East Asia. So I think this was one powerful psychic force that was reshaping this community saying, you know what, you may have been a Marxist when you were young, but it ain't working and you have to change course. So many, many Bengalis who grew up around land reforms got religion that it's actually a terrible idea expropriating other people. Okay, that's how one by one we started getting these new ideas. And the second part is intellectual power. It was people who read books, who thought about the world, who argued and debated at the plane of ideas. So that public policy did not degenerate into mere power play of political economy of this faction is powerful, that faction is powerful. Yes, that matters. Political Political economy is an ever-present feature of the working of the world. But if you only thought political economy, then you'd be telling a story that, you know what, there are these incumbent Indian companies who have 300% tariff protection, Mansur Olson, this is concentrated interest, the beneficiaries are dispersed, these guys have a lock on power, they pay bribes to politicians, game over, India will never get out of 300% customs duties. You could tell that kind of what I call a simplistic political economy story. But you know what? That was not how the story worked out. India did get from 300% customs duties or 350% customs duties to a great wave of tariff reductions that ran all the way till 2007-8. And only now we are back to a period of increasing customs duties. But just year after year, 
the Indian political system was able to play this combination of ideas, interests and institutions and actually pull off one of the world's great uh, episodes of opening up to globalization. So I, I feel it's very important to go inside the minds of these people. I told that story of the stink of a suit that was dry cleaned in India. This is the psychic dynamite that makes things happen. There should be one scene in our web series which is set in a dry cleaners, <laughs> you know. So one yeah. episode should, yeah, you know, encasing. before the packaging, it yeah. should just open with, you know, something being dry cleaned and yeah. blah, 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 and need like being handed over. They're going to need a casting decision for encasing. We are going to need a casting decision for encasing. <laughs>